it is so wonderfully distilled uh, with the, evaporated by the rays of the sun and then the cloud forms the wind disperses the cloud then the water comes out distilled pure water for us to drink we can't drink ocean water uh, we can't go to the ocean and fetch the water for our day to day purpose but the lord is taking care we are taking oxygen and we are breathing giving out carbon dioxide the trees and plants are taking carbon dioxide and giving us back the oxygen so see how wonderfully the god the father has made all these arrangements now see how much he loves us and let us recognize his love for us and try to reciprocate just as uh, your your son is not considering how much you love him and how much you want to speak to him how much you want him to come to you uh, similarly he is waiting and that is how we have to express our love for him and that is the real prayer my lord i love you my lord what can i do for you anyway this way <clears throat> it went on for quite some time and you know at the end what he said uh, he said i have seen six uh six popes but i never heard anyone speak the way you did <laughs> it's actually an honest admission uh the popes can't speak like that although they are saying god the father although they have a very re- well recognized situation but what is the extent of their knowledge and that is the what makes the difference we have the knowledge they don't have and that's why when somebody is willing somebody is eager uh, he finds that when we speak it has so much substance they're so meaningful so this is my one experience with a christian mind you he is not only a christian um, i mean he is a person who is in the vatican for last 40 years he is serving in the vatican for 40 years and he must have been quite high up you know he, the way he was dressed up you know fine black suit tie <laughs> and uh, you could see that you know he must be one of the big officials there anyway that is the thing with the vatican Do you want to hear about an experience that I had with a Muslim gentleman? <laughs> I was flying from Dubai to Bombay and next to me was the head of operations of Emirates sitting next to me. And so you know I initially he looked like an European dressed up in suit and tie and uh, very you know very handsome about 40 years old so we started to talk and then you know like we started to speak to speak about what we stand for he was curious and he we got to know that he was actually in Uh, resident of uh, dubai he uh, you are uh, united arab emirates resident he is <clears throat> the head of uh, operations of uh, emirates and he was coming to bombay and he lived in bombay also for some time and he was actually he spends a time a lot of time in bombay and naturally and uh, yeah he's a, he's the head of the operation of the eastern region which means the bombay is the headquarters it covers the that part of asia and like all the way up to hong kong and china and so anyway we are just talking about god being one god being a person god being the father god being the friend you know like just the understanding that we have and and he was asking questions and you know i was giving the answers about 
how God is a person, how God reciprocates uh, with us. And I was giving uh, the very simple example, the difference between a living body and inert matter, the difference between a living body and a dead body, uh, the soul, the soul not coming from this material world, the soul is coming from the spiritual world, another world, the spiritual sky. And uh, whether we call him Allah or whether we call him Jesus, uh, the God or Jehovah or Krishna, he's the same person, God is one. And, and he was responding, he's an intelligent person. He was responding and he was telling that initially he was, didn't believe in God. But certain experiences that he told me about, uh, like, uh, made him God conscious. Then <clears throat> he, uh, uh, at the end, he told me that, you know, I never spoke to anyone like you. Then he meant dressed up in this way because the Muslims in India have a very strong feeling about saffron colored people saffron robe people because the way it has been the conflict is going on between you know RSS, BJP and uh, like sadhus versus Muslims and so obviously he had his feelings about that you know he didn't say very much about that he said that I never spoke to anyone who is dressed up like you but today I feel that I learned so much from you and then I told him that, you know, our spiritual master went the movement, went and started the movement in America. And he <coughs> <coughs> once was asked by some Roman Catholic priests in New York. They, are, they asked him, why are you converting these Christians into Hindus? And my Guru Maharaj replied that no, I am not converting the Christians into Hindus or Muslims into Jews. I am simply making better Christians out of the Christians, better Jews out of the Jews, better Muslims out of the Muslims and better Hindus out of the Hindus. And I told him that, look, I was born in a Hindu family, but I didn't really know what Hinduism meant until I came across my spiritual master. And today I can tell you the real, un real purpose, real objective of different religions is to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead as He is. And it was so nice that you, ha you were so open with your approach, your uh, questions, and you accepted them so sincerely. And He admitted that, yes, <clears throat> like, this knowledge was so... So this is how we can see that even a Christian, a hardcore Christian from Vatican, uh, an Arab uh, gentleman from Muslim background, when, the, when we speak to them, they immediately recognize that we are not talking about any sectarian thing. We are talking about the Supreme Personality of Godhead in a very, very conceivable scientific way. It is not a blind faith, but it is a matter of understanding him as he is. He is one without a second. So why are you creating this conflict in the, under the banners of different religious, con religious faith? Anyway, at least we can uh, consider that we are very fortunate that we found Krishna consciousness. We came across Srila Prabhupada's teachings and today we are situated in absolute knowledge. We found the highest spiritual understanding, the highest spiritual uh, path that will lead us to the ultimate destination with a very clear understanding that even, uh, I mean what to speak of other different religious groups, even the Hindus, what we have, what to speak of the Hindus, even the Vaishnavas don't have. That is what we got from Srila Prabhupada. 
other four Vaishnav Sampradayas, they don't have any, pro- any information, a proper information about Vrindavan. Their destination is Vaikuntha. So, <clears throat> here we are. Uh, we have the highest spiritual understanding. That also reminds me, <laughs> like, <laughs> I met one Sikh. Sikhs are although very close to Hindus, but uh, here I met one person, uh, very successful family, very well to do, and he's the, from that family. I met him in Dubai, and through one of my uh, acquaintances. And one evening we were supposed to go out. They wanted to go out, take me out in Dubai. They're also there on business. There's a, there's a boy whom I knew from his college days, uh, Subod, Subod Dalal. He's the son of India's, uh, one of the Air Force generals, son. And his partner, business partner, uh, Paramjit Singh, uh, Sikh. And so we... They came, they, uh, they met me when they got to know that. So when Subod got to know that I was in Dubai, he wanted to see me. So we met in the afternoon. I invited them for lunch where I was staying. And then they wanted to spend some time with me in the evening. And they wanted to take me out actually. I said, okay, fine. You know, I'm here for a day, so two days. I will go out with them and but then we had a little talk in the afternoon then Paramji changed the plan he said he told Subodh I don't want to go out with Maharaj I want to spend this one hour with him talking to him so <clears throat> Subodh called me and I said fine that's much better than going out <laughs> so they came to see me where I was staying and that discussion for one, instead of one hour, it went on for three hours. And not only that, Paramjit was telling, Maharaj, next time you come to Delhi, you must stay with us. Now, you see, the Sikhs, I don't know how much you know about their attitude. They don't really blend with the Hindus. And I was thinking, you know, he may be so favorable. But I don't know how the, the family is going to take it. So I, although I said yes, yes, but I knew I'm not going to stay at your place. But through Subodh, he got to know when I was arriving. And here it is. When I landed in the airport, somebody receives me right inside the airport, brings me out. And here is a big car waiting for me. And others also came to see me. And so he, uh, so he drove me to his house. And not only th- their house, their three brothers have three villas. <laughs> and, and so anyway, so I was kind of, and I was so surprised to see the family. They became so receptive. And then one evening, I stayed for two days, and one evening we had a program and the whole lot of devotees came from Gurgaon. Uh, generally in Gurgaon is the place where I usually stay. And not only that, his father, Paramjit's father, made a condition. He said, he, his condition is, whenever I go to Delhi, I have to stay at their house. <laughs> <laughs> and last time I met Paramjit, Paramjit was telling me that he uh, found out that Guru Nanak actually met Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I said, wow. <laughs> like him telling, there is a follower of Guru Nanak, six, and he is admitting that Guru Nanak met Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is how, when one gives us a patient hearing, this is how they get, get affected. Uh, all it's a matter of just listening to us, because Prabhupada has given us the highest information. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave us the perfect understanding of the spiritual reality. 
Hemanga, you are, uh, you are nodding your head. You met Paramjit, yeah? You came to their house also, yeah. What do you think of that family? <laughs> yeah, and they're very wealthy family actually. Very wealthy family. And his father, he's 80 years old, but he's straight as a very fit person and he told once he was driving me we are going to meet some politician we are going to meet Uma Bharati actually and uh, he was driving the car he said I don't let the driver drive my car I drive myself <laughs> and anyway so this is it like anybody who is willing to listen cannot help but becoming convinced about Krishna consciousness. So how did you like these stories? <laughs> and I told you, these are not stories, but histories. <laughs> so the, per the goal is actually, huh? Bhagavatam stories. This is a Bhagavatam story actually. We are just presenting Bhagavatam and this is the result. And why do you have to go that far? Didn't this happen to all of you? Huh? Sunilman, were you born devotee? Then what happened? <laughs> yeah. What about you, Jamnacharya? <laughs> so, Mukundahari? <laughs> Met a devotee and something happened without you even knowing what was happening. Isn't it? <clears throat> Rasa Rasik, what about you? Same. Is that the case with all of you? Huh? You are not a devotee, but became a devotee. Hmm? What did, why did it, how did it happen? Satya? Yeah. Talking, yeah. Talking to devotees and and look what happened to her. <laughs> of course, she has a very special devotee acquaintance. Uh, her cousin is, <laughs> she is the cousin of Guru Gauranga. Uh, and Guru Gauranga actually made her into a devotee. <laughs> made her in the sense Guru Gauranga spoke to her about Krishna consciousness. And made her watch Abhacharan. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <clears throat> so Parikshit Maharaj had been cursed by the Brahmana boy. Do you all, are you now back to that scene? Who is that Brahmana boy? Shringi. And he cursed him that he would die within seven days being bitten by a celestial serpent called Takshak. Now what did Parikshit Maharaj do as soon as he got the news? Did he call some snake doctors <laughs> uh, to counteract the snake poison? No. Uh, he said, okay, I have to leave my body. If that's, the, that's what the Lord wants, fine, I'm ready. <clears throat> now see Parikshit Maharaj's situation. Do you remember when Parikshit Maharaj was in the womb of his mother? Then Ashwatthama, the son of Dronacharya, released the Brahmastra uh, to destroy him. The last uh, member of the, the Kuru dynasty. The only surviving member. Otherwise, besides the Pandava, five brothers, everyone was dead in that family. So he was the only surviving ca member of the family in the womb of the mother. So Ashutama wanted to destroy him. But when he was in the womb of his mother, Krishna came and saved him. So when he was in the womb of his mother, Krishna came and saved him. And now, a Brahmana boy's curse uh, is going to make him die. What do we understand this way? 
from these happenings. These are all Krishna's divine arrangement. When we take shelter of Krishna, when we surrender to Krishna, Krishna takes care of us. Marobi rakhobi joi chatohara. If and that is the attitude of a devotee. Krishna, if you want to keep me, if you want to save me, if you want to protect me, you can do that. If you protect me, then no one can kill me. And if you want me to die, fine. Because I know when you want me to die, nobody can save me. So that is a wonderful demonstration of Parikshit Maharaj's submissive attitude. Krishna, you want me to die? Actually, you, it, it came in the form, your wish has come in the form of the curse of a Brahmana. It is not that the Brahmana cursed me. That's how Parikshit Maharaj was seeing. It's not that the Brahmana boy cursed me. It is your desire that is manifesting in the form of this curse. So if you want me to, I am not going to be perturbed by that. And in a way I can say that how this Krishna consciousness movement has affected different individuals. Because it's not only that this kind of attitude is demonstrated by Parikshit Maharaj. This kind of attitude becomes common with all those who have taken shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. I will give you an example. Right here, Jamunacharya, his only son died in a car accident and he was totally unperturbed. I was in America at that time. I phoned him. And I even told him, Jamnacharya, I'm coming down. Uh, he said, no, Maharaj, there's no need for that. Like, if Krishna wanted, he took him. Krishna gave him to me, and now Krishna has taken him back. So how can one have this kind of faith in Krishna to display this kind of detachment? Anybody in this condition would have been completely devastated. Uh, but I saw personally how Jamnacharya and his wife Chitra Devi was not affected by that. Why? Because they understood. Uh, first of all, everything happens by Krishna's divine arrangement. Uh, and their son was not their son. They are Krishna's part and parcel who came to them as a son and now that Krishna has taken him. And time and time again I am seeing how Jamnacharya and Chitra are completely dedicated to Krishna. Their whole purpose is to help Krishna consciousness and see that this movement is spreading all over. So these are the practical demonstration. When we understand, like not only Parikshit Maharaj, why did Parikshit Maharaj develop that attitude? Because of Krishna consciousness. Therefore, anyone who properly, properly accepts the process of Krishna consciousness will develop this attitude. Marobi rakhobi joi tohara. Recently one disciple of mine in London, she was leaving her body. Whenever I used to speak to her, she used to tell me, Guru Maharaj, I just want to leave. <laughs> I don't want to continue. And she was, although she had terminal cancer for so long, she was suffering so much, but her spirit was so high, as if she was not at all affected. And when she left the body, she left in such a nice Krishna conscious mood. Another such example in London again uh, was uh, maybe uh, you don't know her, but you know her daughter, that is Janava, uh, Janava's mother, Sabitri Priya. Uh, 
Uh, I got to know that doctor said she has only seven days left. And I was speaking to her and she told me that she had a dream that I came to see her. I was in America at that time. So when I heard that she wanted, she had a dream like that. So I said, okay, at least let me try to uh, fulfill that dream that she had. So I immediately I took a flight and went there. I was thinking that I, that she would be in a, like in seven days she was going to leave her body. So she must be very bedridden and very sick. So from the airport, I went straight to her house. And as soon as I went there, she got out of the bed to offer me obeisances. <laughs> I had to tell her, please don't do that. But she wouldn't listen. And then, <clears throat> anyway, I spent some time with her. It was so nice. She was very, very Krishna conscious. She was telling me how much she liked to hear me sing, so I sang for her. <laughs> she didn't mean that. She didn't ask me to sing, but she was telling that how she plays the uh, the CDs and listening to my songs, how much she likes Prabhupada's lectures, and and <clears throat> so in that condition she was. But her spirit was so high, as if I could see that she was not in her bodily platform. And when she left her body, you know how she left her body? She had a bead bag in her hand. She was chanting. And just before she left her body, she lifted her hand, put the bead bag on her head. And she left her body. How can one do things like that? That also reminds me another very wonderful incident. <clears throat> she was only a 22-year-old girl, very beautiful young girl, a disciple of Radhanath Maharaj uh, from Bombay. She developed some di incurable disease and she kind of became quite okay, but then uh, that day she got her result for her uh, graduation and she came home and spoke to her mother and then she became all of a sudden she got this attack I mean she became unconscious she was taken to the hospital she was in the emergency mm, ward intensive care ward she was unconscious just before leaving her body, she became conscious. And she saw the oxygen tubes and intravenous things and all that. So she said, please take them off. So she wanted, so they took it off. And she said, that, please let everybody chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> like a 21 year old girl <laughs> and uh, she just left while the devotees were chanting Hare Krishna very peacefully I often remember her she was very close to me also uh, she used to I used to when I used to go to Pune they used to be in Pune before I used to stay with them and she used to cook very nicely. Uh, she, her subject was home science. Her <laughs> and she used to, uh, one of her things that she used to do is she used to cook. And she learned how to cook in, this, in the subject. And her mother also was a very good cook. She's a Punjabi family. And she was so lively, full of vitality and very vivacious. And just left her body and in what kind of consciousness she left her body and time and time again we are seeing that how the and that is the proof of the authenticity of krishna consciousness authenticity of the process that we are practicing not only how we live 
but how we die also and that is the final test dying to conquer death therefore once i gave a seminar a series of seminars at different places actually called the art of dying <laughs> krishna consciousness actually is an art of dying the way to immortality through death we reach the region of immortality <coughs> so <coughs> parikshit maharaj met sukadev goswami and sukadev goswami explained to him uh Lord Parikshit Maharaj asked him, "What's the goal of life?" And that is the point. What's the goal of life? That's what Krishna Consciousness Movement is teaching us. What's the goal of life? What should we do with this life? Uh, now that we got this human form, what should we do with it? Should we just lead our life eating, sleeping, mating, and defending? No. that is the animal these are the animal propensities an animal live an animal lives for these purposes eating sleeping mating defending but the human form of life is a higher purpose to fulfill the purpose of its existence why we are here and especially now that we got this very special body this human body is a very special gift of nature we have developed intelligence and we have the ability to expand our consciousness we have the ability to expand our consciousness to such an extent that we can conceive the inconceivable that is what only the human beings can do to conceive the inconceivable inconceivable or chinta uh, what your mind can conceive is chinta thoughts but this is something that cannot be conceived without thoughts that's why it is inconceivable but this in the human form of life can be conceivable and how is it conceived if we follow the process then in our hearts the knowledge will be revealed dibbo gyan hride prakashita tene brahma rida adi kavaye muihanti jatsuraya at the very first verse of shrimad bhagavatam this point has been made uh, what is this shrimad bhagavatam Uh, shrimad bhagavatam is uh, the knowledge about that inconceivable completely independent personality of godhead and this knowledge is revealed in the heart it is not we can receive knowledge in two ways with our head and with our heart material knowledge we conceive with our head but the spiritual knowledge we conceive within our heart this knowledge was first imparted by krishna to lord brahma tene brahma rida adi kavaye muihanti jatsuraya this knowledge was imparted to brahma by the supreme personality of godhead in the heart of lord brahma the knowledge that bewilders even the demigods jats muihanti bewilders jats sura sura means demigods even the demigods are bewildered with this topic they can't understand it but this knowledge can be imparted as we sing every day dibbo gyan hride prakashito the transcendental knowledge is revealed in the heart 
it's revealed in the heart. It's a revelation. How it happens? It happens by Krishna's mercy. <clears throat> the other day, when I was in Bombay in someone's house doing a program, and one question came up. Here, Mukundari, you were there. <laughs> so, one question came up. Is it necessary to have this knowledge? Uh, so what I was speaking, she was questioning whether it's necessary to have this knowledge. And I explained to her that it is not a kind of a knowledge that one acquires by reading books. It is a kind of a knowledge that happens automatically. Just like when you are in broad daylight, then you see everything uh, as they are. You don't have to get to know about them by reading books. Right? Say, uh, in broad daylight you come to Ujjain, you will see what Ujjain is like. You don't have to read Ujjain, the, the geography book of Ujjain, you know, to understand what Ujjain is. You will see what it is. So that is what transcendental knowledge is like, that you don't really have to make an effort to learn. It will automatically be revealed. And in that respect we can remember Bhakti Devi has two offsprings, two sons. Do you know who are those two sons of Bhakti Devi? Jnana and Vaidagya. So bhakti, when you cultivate bhakti, when you receive the mercy of bhakti, when you have developed bhakti in your heart, then her two sons automatically follow. That is knowledge and renunciation. So that is what divogyan is. And this is what this knowledge Krishna gave to Brahma in his heart. So here we go into the creation part of it. Brahma appeared from the navel of the Lord. From the navel of the Lord, one lotus sprouted. And Brahma found himself sitting on that lotus. He didn't know where the lotus was coming from, but he found himself sitting on a lotus and there was an endless ocean just imagine uh, Brahma's situation. Uh, he's sitting on a lotus and there is water, water everywhere. <laughs> There's nothing but just water. And he doesn't have any recollection of his past. He, he is fully conscious now, but he doesn't have any memory of his past. So Brahma began to wonder. Uh, who am I? Like naturally, that's the first question. What's happening? What's happening here? <laughs> who am I? <laughs> I'm here. Where did I come from? And what am I supposed to do? So Brahma thought that if he climbed down the stem of the lotus, if he reaches the bottom, then he'll find out where, who he is. Because if he goes to the bottom, he goes to the root, then he'll find out where he came from because he is coming from that lotus so for thousand years Brahma climbed down but didn't reach the bottom and it has been described that Brahma came very close to the spiritual personality of the Lord but because Brahma didn't have the proper vision he couldn't see it in order to see the spiritual reality we need the spiritual vision so Brahma then climbed up and sat on the lotus again. And the water of the Garbha ocean was splashing against each other. Waves were splashing, creating a sound like tapaha, tapaha, tapaha. And from that Brahma got the inspiration to go within. The Lord actually provided that inspiration to go within. The point is, okay Brahma, going without, you came to the point of no endless bottom. You couldn't find out, you couldn't find the end. 
by climbing down or by means of your external endeavor. So now that failed, what other course do you have? Go within. So then Brahma con uh, projected his consciousness within his heart. And as a result of that, he saw, not saw, he first heard a sound. He heard a beautiful sound. What was the sound? Sound of Krishna's flute. And what was the sound saying? Oh, oh. The sound made Brahma think. He made, he just focused on the sound. And then from the sound, uh, he began to hear other words also coming out. And that was Gayatri. In this way, Brahma received the Gayatri. And he kept on meditating on that Gayatri mantra. And as a result of that, the transcendental knowledge was revealed in the heart of Brahma. Tene Brahmarida Adikavaye Muihanti Jatsuraya. He got the transcendental knowledge. <clears throat> what was that knowledge like? What, what happened to Brahma? And that is Brahma Samhita. Uh, Brahma saw the spiritual sky. He was transported to the spiritual sky. He was sitting in the lotus, but now he is in another world. And that world is Chintamani Prakara Sadmasu. Gulp of Riksha, he was seeing a beautiful place with beautiful houses, Prakara Sadmasu, and they were made with touchstones, Chintamani. Gulp of Riksha, there are many trees, it's a forest, a, a place full of trees, but all those trees are Gulp of Rikshas. Chintamani, Prakara Sadmasu, Gulp of Riksha. Laksha Vriteshu Surabhir Abhipalayantam. He is tending hundreds of thousands of cows. And all these cows are Surabhi cows. The Surabhi cows are also desire fulfilling cows. Surabhir Abhipalayantam. He is sporting with beautiful damsels, the most beautiful girls. Who are they? Lakshmi's. Lakshmi Shahasra Sata Sambrahma Se Brahmanam. So this is how he saw. He was transported to the spiritual sky and that's what he is seeing. And then he is seeing Venum Kanantam Aravinda Dalaya Taksham Barhavatam He is playing a flute. He has a peacock feather on his head. His complexion is Samasita Ambudam, Sundarangam. His beautiful form has the color of the monsoon cloud or blue sapphire. Shama Sundaram, Achinta Gunaswarupam. And this is how Brahma saw. And the transcendental knowledge revealed in his heart from that. Uh, he not only saw the Lord, uh, he saw uh, his wonderful qualities. He saw him as Ramadi Murti Shukala Niyamen Atishthan. He expanded himself into various incarnations like Ram, Nishinga, Varaha, Kurma. And <clears throat> that personality, he saw how he is the source of everything. Maya hi jasa jagadanda satani sute, traigunna tad vishaya veda vitaya mana. He saw the relationship of Maya with him. He saw the relationship with Lord Shiva with him. He saw the relationship with Durga with him. He saw the relationship of Ganesha with him. So in this way he saw 
everything in the light of that personality. So that is what happened to Brahma. Just by meditating upon, meditating on that mantra, the transcendental knowledge was revealed in the heart. And how did the revelation take place? He was transported to the spiritual world. He was seeing everything face to face. And that's how he was describing in Brahma Samhita. So, <clears throat> in this way, the, the transcendental knowledge was first revealed in the heart of Brahma. And then Brahma got the instruction. What he was supposed to do. He came here with a purpose. To create. The Lord has done the preliminary creation. But now Brahma has to do the secondary creation. What is the secondary creation uh, in relation to the preliminary or principal creation? In the principal creation, the Lord created the universe. Then he filled up the universe, the innumerable universes generated from the breathing of Mahavishnu. Just like when you breathe under water, then what happens? The bubbles are generated. So due to the breathing of Mahavishnu, innumerable bubbles are created in the, universe, in the causal ocean. And each bubble is an universe. So he entered into each of these universes as Garbhodokshai Vishnu. And he generated water from his own body. He entered there and from his own body he created water. And filled up the universe with that water. And then he laid down the moment he wanted to lie down in that uh, Garbha ocean, understanding his desire, immediately Ananta Shesh appeared there. An expansion of Balaram. Uh, Balaram takes care of all the needs of Krishna. Uh, all the articles for Krishna's pleasure is an expansion of Balaram. So Krishna wanted to lie or Vishnu, uh, Garvodoksha Vishnu wanted to lie in the, in the Garbha ocean. So immediately Balaram expanded himself as Ananta Shesha. Because a snake can lie, uh, float on the water. Uh, so he became a snake. Uh, and he became the bed of Vishnu. And immediately Lakshmi Devi came and started to serve uh, Garbhodokshai Vishnu. And then from the navel of Garbhodokshai Vishnu came out a lotus. Uh, and Brahma was situated in that. So this is how the creation began. That is the real understanding of the creation. And so up to this point, he did all the creation, Vishnu, Mahavishnu, Garbhodokshai Vishnu, uh, and from him came Brahma. Uh, and now Brahma got the responsible to do the interior decoration. Uh, the house has been built, now uh, the interior decoration. So that is Brahma's responsibility. And this decoration was not done by creating some houses and etc., this decoration was done by creating living entities. Uh, so Brahma got to know his responsibility. Now he will have to create living entities. So Brahma was so powerful that from his mind he could create. In a way just as Krishna can do same things just by his will, Brahma also has the ability to create from his will. Uh, just like as we know, uh, God said, let there be light. What happened? He simply wanted that let there be light and there was light. Uh, similarly, Brahma also considered, let there be sons. And immediately four sons appeared. 
<clears throat> and Brahma said, look, my sons, this is the responsibility I have been assigned with, so uh, you all help me, assist me. Now these sons were situated in knowledge. So they said, sorry father, <laughs> not getting involved into this messy business. <laughs> we know what it is like. Huh? We don't want to get involved in that. So then, you know, Brahma got angry. Uh, like my son, I'm their father. I'm instructing them. I'm asking them to do something. See how disobedient they are. They don't listen to my instructions. And then, uh, immediately Brahma thought, See, Brahma is so powerful that just from his mind, as he wanted, he created children. So can you imagine what his anger would be like? His anger would immediately destroy these children. So Brahma considered, they are my children. I should not be angry with them because they will be destroyed. So Brahma restrained his anger. And although he restrained his anger, his anger came out in the form of Rudra, Lord Shiva's incarnation in this material nature. Rudra, the aspect of destruction. Then, Brahma instructed them. He knew that they are, they are going to be uh, devastating. So Brahma said, okay, you all restrain yourself. Uh, control yourself. Uh, you do not... Uh, rather, your business is to control yourself. So that's why we find the incarnation of Lord Shiva. Uh, generally, they are very peaceful. Shiva means uh, peaceful and auspicious. And so this is how Brahma controlled his anger, but although he tried to control his anger, his anger came out in the form of these personalities of Rudra. Then Brahma created uh, ten sons from his mind. Those ten sons are Nine Prajapati, uh, eight Prajapatis, Daksha and uh, Narad. Pulasta, Pulaha, Kratu, Angira, Modichi, Bashishta, uh, uh, Kratu, Atri, um, Daksha and Narad. So these are the ten sons and now nine of them became involved in procreation or creation. Here the creation was mostly in the form of procreation. Uh, producing children and initial offsprings of Brahma started to come from him through his mind or through different parts of his body. From his shadow appeared a personality, Kardama Muni. From his right hand side came out a personality, Manu. From his left hand side came out a personality, Shatarupa. The first man and first woman. From Lord's right hand side is Manu. From his left hand side, Shatarupa. The first man and woman. And from them started the procreation through uh, union between man and woman. Procreation through uh, copulation. Couple. Uh, when the couple united, then the offsprings appear. So then, <clears throat> and this is how Manu is actually our forefather. From this word Manu, from this name Manu, came Manava. Manu's offsprings are Manavas. 
just as Danu's offspring are Danavas. Diti's offspring are Daityas. Aditi's offspring are Adityas. In this way, the offspring take the name in relation to the father or mother. So Manu is the first man. And Manu's Man, uh, this Manu then had five children, two sons and one daughter, three daughters. The sons are Priyavrata and Uttanapad. And three daughters are Akuti, Prashuti and Devahuti. Devahuti hmm, was given to Kardama Muni, a great exalted personality. And he was told by Lord Brahma that you procreate, you create offsprings. Because that's Brahma's purpose. The universe now empty has to be filled up. So Kardama Muni considered that in order to do that I have to become qualified. So he went and performed austerities for thousand years. And then Brahma was actually the Lord instructed Manu to offer his daughter to Kardama Muni. Devahuti to Kardama Muni. And Brahma also instructed Kardama Muni, that uh, such and such personality is going to come, Sayambhava Manu is going to come to offer his daughter to you. So you accept her as your wife. Now here also we can see another ideal householder, an example of an ideal householder. Uh, like the moment he heard uh, that he has to procreate. Uh, straight away he didn't go and get married. He decided I have to qualify myself so that my offsprings become qualified. And he performed austerities too so that the senses are controlled in the thoughts of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is the way to control the senses. Uh, and as I mentioned, the austerities are not austerities to achieve something, but the austerities are the natural outcome of one's attachment to the Lord. So what he actually went to do is to meditate, to focus his mind or fix his mind at the lotus feet of the Lord. That is the goal. And as he did that, he naturally became detached from material attachments. So he, <clears throat> and then he is being informed that, well, uh, such and such girl is being brought to you, so please accept her as your wife. So Sayambhuva Manu came to Kardama Muni with his daughter, with his wife Devahuti, and a few soldiers with him, and offered his daughter. Now, uh, Sayambhuva Manu is the ruler. He is the king of the, king of the earth planet. Now he is offering his daughter a princess who never really seen any hardship in her entire life. Now she is being offered to a person who doesn't even have a place to stay. <laughs> not that he doesn't have a place to stay. He is not, not interested in any place to stay. And this girl, the princess, accepted that situation. She is my husband. My goal is to follow him. And prior to that, something also happened. Narad Muni told her about Kardama Muni and about hearing about Kardama Muni, Devahuti fall in love, fell in love with him and accepted him as a husband. She knew that he is a completely renounced, a person who doesn't have any external senses uh, and she accepted him as a husband. 
she accepted a lifestyle from the palace uh, to a hermitage and the bank of a river. Uh, of course, a beautiful place. The description of the place is beautiful. Uh, there's lots of fruit and flower bearing trees, uh, colorful flowers, ripe fruits. There are beautiful birds singing. The bees are flying around, humming from flower to flower. There are other saintly personalities who are also absorbed uh, in meditation. Uh, so uh, Devahuti accepted that life. And she was serving his, her husband with all her ability. So much so that she did not care for eating and sleeping and caring for herself. And as a result of that, her body became emaciated. The beautiful princess now became like a skeleton. Her hair, beautiful black hair, now they become matted. Because she didn't care for herself. So from this is how a time and time again from this Vedic uh, description we can get to see uh, what is an ideal husband should be like and how should an ideal wife be like. The western culture has destroyed the human culture. Uh, the Vedic culture is a real human culture which is based on love not based on selfish motivations. Just based on, for the sake of her love for her husband, she's prepared to accept any kind of situation. And then, all of a sudden, one day, Kardama Muni saw, just happened to see his wife. And he felt, my God, what did I do to my wife? She's a princess, and look what happened to her. Her beautiful body has become emaciated like a, like a skeleton. Her beautiful hair has become matted. Her body has lost all the luster. And all for my sake, she's taking care of me in such a way that she didn't care for herself at all. So now Kardama Muni is going to display his mystic power. So he immediately created a chariot. It's not a chariot. It was a city uh, with the ability to fly. That place was filled with demigods dancing and singing. Bidadharas are dancing, Gandharvas were chanting. Uh, and so many other beautiful men and women ready to serve them. And it has been described that it is a kind of a chariot that even Indra, the king of demigods, can't even imagine in his remotest dream. <laughs> the king of demigods cannot even imagine a, such a chariot in his remotest dream. And uh, he <clears throat> also created one lake. And that lake, he asked his wife, Devahuti, go take a bath in the lake. So when she went there, she found there are so many celestial damsels ready to serve her. Some uh, took her by hand and into the water. Some started to scrub her body, massage her body. <laughs> and, and in no time, she assumed a form which is the most beautiful so much so that even the demigods would become stunned looking at her. And when she came out, she found that Kardama Muni also has assumed such a beautiful, handsome form. And then together they traveled in that spaceship. And the spaceship could expand according to one's desire. And go to any place according to their desire. And in that spaceship for a long time they traveled around the three parts of the universe upper, 
middle and lower. And then they came back to their abode. There Kardama Muni accepted his uh, form as a sage. And nine daughters were born. I'm sorry, 16 daughters were born from them. And then he was about to leave. So Devahuti told him, My Lord, you promised me to give me a son. So please uh, fulfill that commitment of yours. So then Kardamamuni stayed back. And the Lord then came to Kardamamuni and said that I have been so pleased with you that I am going to accept, I am going to become your son. And that is Kapil Muni. So when Kapil Muni, after Kapil Muni was born, Kardama Muni told him that, My Lord, if I see you as my son, I won't be able to properly meditate on you. So I'm leaving now so that from a distance I can fix my mind at your lotus feet. So here we can see that Kardama Muni's relationship with Krishna was in Santaras. In Santaras he simply want to me wanted to meditate upon the Lord. Even though the Lord has appeared to him as his son and he could develop Batsalaras, he didn't want to accept it. That's why it says, Jar Jai Roshai Shei Sharbuttama. Whatever one constitutional mellow is, he considers that to be the highest. He considers that to be the highest. So, <clears throat> he then uh, left home to meditate upon the Lord. And he assured Debahuti that I am leaving you under the custody of my son. And Kardama Muni instructed Devahuti, I'm sorry, Kapil Muni instructed Devahuti on Bhakti Yoga. And he came to re-establish Sankha Yoga. So Kapil, Kapil Dev has established the proper Sankhya. There are two types of Sankhas are prevalent. One is atheistic Sankha and the other is devotional Sankha or theistic Sankha. There are two Kapils also. There is one Kapil who was born in an Agni dynasty, a king. He was born in a royal family. He became a saintly personality and he prop propounded the Sankha philosophy which is atheistic. It's analyzing the material nature without accepting the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But the real Sankha is theistic Sankha. The real goal of Sankha is to transcend the material nature and come to the spiritual reality. <clears throat> In the 11th canto, Uddha, when speaking, he is also speaking about Sankha and he spoke about various types of Sankhas. The Sankhas that are dealing with 16 elements, Sankhas that are dealing with 24 elements, Sankhas that are dealing with 26 elements, six, 26 considerations. But in Bhagavad Gita also we get Sankha. As I was saying, the purpose of Sankha is to transcend the material nature and come to the spiritual platform. And what is that uh, that Krishna gave in Bhagavad Gita in just four lines? Bhumi rapo analo bayu khang mano buddhi devacha ahankara itiyang me bhinna prakriti rashtadha. Now the, with this eight consideration, Krishna analyzed the entire material nature. Bhinna prakriti rashtadha. But then he considered aparayamitastannan prakriting vidhi me param. These are separated energy of mind. But beyond that there is a superior energy from which the living entities are coming and they are sustaining this material nature. 
Sankha ultimately goes into that point. Objective, the object and subject. This external world is object. No matter how we analyze it, with eight considerations or 25 considerations, it's external. But that is objective. But object rests on the subject. The subject is I. Jajedang dharjate jagat. This living entity, the I, is sustaining this material nature. Dharjate jagat. We are here, that's why material nature is manifest. When none of us will be in when none of us will be here, then what will happen? When there is nobody to witness this material nature, what will happen? The material nature will become unmanifest. Abhakta dini bhutani, bhakta madhani bharata. Abhakta nidhana neva tatra ka paridevana. So, this nature was, material nature was unmanifest. It became manifest and then it will become unmanifest again. When it becomes manifest, when the Lord glances towards this material nature, through the glance of the Lord, the living entity has come into the material nature, and the material nature becomes manifest. And when the Lord withdraws his glances, then all the living entities are withdrawn from the material nature then the material nature becomes unmanifest once again. <clears throat> so, Kapil Muni actually gave the perfect Sankha philosophy. But to his mother what he gave is bhakti, pure devotional service. Thank you all very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. I just kept a few minutes about 20 minutes for question answers so any question okay some written questions are here okay give it give the mic to her Well, at the beginning, some some source had to be there. <laughs> they had to come from one. So Brahma was. Uh, so here we have to understand that these two separate parts of Brahma were actually the male and female. Uh, although they came from the same personality, but they are not brother and sister in that sense. Okay. <clears throat> Hare Krishna Maharaj, this question is from, thank you, okay, Rasamrita Devi Dasi. Uh, where is Rasa? Okay. <laughs> uh, your interaction with the people of various faiths uh, shows your deep compassion for all living entities. May I ask you to speak about the qualities and mood that we should develop as preachers of ISKCON so that we too can impact on the people that we meet. Rasamrita Devi Dasi also, uh, that's the second question? Yeah. So this is the first and that's the second. <laughs> well, I don't know what to say. Only thing I can say is that I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> So whenever I find somebody to talk to, <laughs> it's a, <laughs> and often time we get a nice result. And <laughs> actually often I make, I make acquaintance with people uh, in my flight. <laughs> the other day also I was flying from Bombay to Calcutta and next to me there was one person, you know, 
we can see that you know he's a, a quite a successful businessman uh, and so and we started to talk and <laughs> I didn't really feel any such compassion to tell you frankly. <laughs> But as I say, like I like to talk. <laughs> so he started to talk. And what can he talk about? Uh, we can talk about only one thing, uh, Krishna consciousness or rather uh, try to make things lead to that point. And this person also at the end he told me that uh he was religious uh, he was he was religious but that was about all he did not really have any interest or but after talking to me you know like he felt that this is something that one should seriously consider not just you know go to the temple and uh, offer obeisances and prayers with some uh, desire dhanam dehi janam dehi <laughs> give me money give me this give me that uh, so and it's like that you know we develop some relationship day before yesterday or two days before yesterday i was in bombay and i told my secretary uh, ananda to call him up and and he came to the program and in that program also and uh, some of you also were in that program uh, and he was uh, he was when he was leaving he was telling he thanked me for for you know like enlightening him he learned so much he was telling me so that's how it is like we talk and some people like to hear <laughs> next question when the knowledge is revealed in the heart of lord brahma is the knowledge already situated in his heart or must it be uh what's that huh okay or transferred must have been transferred there okay yeah see jiva is also satchidananda chit the knowledge aspect is there in him only thing is is covered the knowledge is there with the jivas but is covered so what cultivation of krishna consciousness does is removes the covering just consider a bulb if there's a black paint on it will any light come out uh-huh. so the light is there inside the bulb all we do is scrub the black paint off then the automatically the light come out similarly the spirit soul has the knowledge but it is a matter of removing the external covering then the knowledge automatically shines forth mm. thank you okay some more questions here this is from palika where is palika okay <clears throat> dear maharaj please accept my obeisances all glories to shri prabhupad you are telling you are talking about how if people just listen to a devotee then their heart can be transferred transformed how can we make someone favorable to hearing about krishna without causing offense why should there be any offense uh, you are bestowing your mercy why should this is mercy not offense well if somebody doesn't want to listen to you or talk to you then don't bother about it don't waste your time talk to those who want to listen to you okay like if somebody feels offended uh, 
then what's the point in talking to him? Give her the mic. Yeah, that's the thing I said. Say, for example, a Muslim. Uh, if, he, if he feels offended, if you talk to him about Hinduism, so-called, then why waste your time with him? There's so many people who may be willing to listen to you. You got the point? Like, listen to, uh, speak to somebody who is willing. Right? We, our business is not to grab one by his neck and <laughs> is that Devahuti? Yeah. Devahuti, this is your question? Okay. <clears throat> Dearest Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances at your divine lotus feet. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your divine grace. <laughs> Although I have been blessed with a human form and have been introduced to the process of Krishna consciousness, I must honestly admit that despite hearing, experiencing and realizing the authenticity, power of Krishna consciousness, uh, authenticity and power of Krishna consciousness I fail to follow uninterruptedly or spontaneously what should I do okay just carry on doing it whatever you are doing. just keep on chanting read Prabhupada's books that's the thing that you must do chant at least a few rounds every day I know you are very busy uh, so it may not be possible to chant 16 rounds. It may not be possible for you to read for one hour. But at least make it a point to chant, make it a point to read some pages, and <clears throat> make it a point to associate with good devotees whenever you have time. I know you're so busy that you don't even get time to eat. That's what your mother told me. And... Devahuti is actually studying to become a judge. Like there is a thing, there is a course that you make that, complete that course and then you become a judge straight away. I mean with some training though. So it's, you can see that it's very, very arduous. It takes a lot of effort. Nothing comes easy. So, but still you are chanting to so continue. Mm. You see, you are in a situation where you cannot really commit yourself to, as you said, uninterrupted uh, and unconditional uh, devotional service. Okay, that's not possible. Mm. So go through whatever you are going through and then become fully surrendered to Krishna. Uh, you know that that's the goal. It may not be now. It may not be possible now. Like see for example a child. When he's a child then it behaves in a certain way. It's expected that the child would behave in that way. But when the child grows up then, the child beha then he behaves in another way. Uh, so if you're a child now behave like a child. And then when you grow up It'll happen. Okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Some questions from the internet. Also Nishingananda Das from South Africa. 
Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, when the creation is destroyed, all living entities enter into the body of Mahavishnu. During the creation, other living entities projected into the material world through the glance of Mahavishnu or through Garbhodakshai Vishnu, as in the case of Lord Brahma. Your servant, Nishingananda Das. Yeah. So glance is from Mahavishnu, Nishingananda. It is Mahavishnu's glance that makes the material nature, nature agitated. She becomes, she was inactive and now she became active. She became agitated due to the glance. As if by the glance of a man, a woman becomes agitated. So the ultimate man looks at the ultimate woman material nature uh, and material nature becomes agitated and the living entities are now projected uh, so the point is it is through the glance of Mahavishnu that the material nature uh, conceives the living entities so <clears throat> Next is Dhira Gauda Das. Okay. Dhanavat Pranam Guru Maharaj, please accept my most humble obeisances. You mentioned that it was the desire of Krishna that Parikshit Maharaj should leave and age of Kali should begin. So is it also Krishna's desire that people in Kali Yuga should commit sinful activities in, the order, in order to help Kali Yuga grow? Yeah. It's not Krishna's desire. You see, the living entities in the material nature get an opportunity to act independently. And Krishna doesn't interfere in that. Uh, so every living entity has his independence to act the way he wants. And as I mentioned in the morning, a living entity actually has the independence to only do two things. Either look at Krishna or look away from Krishna. That is the only independence we have. When you look away from Krishna, then we plunge into this cycle of birth and death. But when you look towards Krishna, then you go back to the spiritual sky. So it's just a matter of you know looking. Which way should we look? Which, which way should we project our consciousness? Towards Krishna or away from Krishna? When it is projected away from Krishna, it is Maya. We are in the domain of Maya. Krishna's external energy. When it is projected towards Krishna, then it is projected towards Krishna's internal energy. That's the only independence we have. Now, you see, as a result of our activities, we create karma, right? Karmic reactions. And those living entities, those who have acquired a lot of sinful karma, they come to the age of Kali. <laughs> they get their body in the age of Kali. And they get a chance to become very, very sinful. Right, They get a perfect situation because they're sinful. They want to be sinful. Their sinful reactions uh, take its shape uh, and they get an opportunity to act accordingly. Right? But here also they have one advantage to look towards Krishna. And the benefit is the moment we look towards Krishna then the result is inconceivable just making a little towards Krishna and immediately Krishna's mercy comes down to pick us up. All you have to do is just have faith, chant the holy name. Krishna will do the rest. That's the advantage of the age of Kali. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Dira Gaur. So next question is from Dilkush. Okay. 
Very good. <clears throat> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. My question is, why different people give different philosophy regarding our Supreme Personality of Godhead? Although there is only one way to achieve Him is Bhakti Yoga. Because that is creating confusion in choosing the way to achieve the Supreme. Okay, so no more question. Huh? Yeah. <clears throat> you see, as I mentioned, in the material nature, everyone has the independence to act the way he wants. Similarly, uh, one has the independence to speak the way he wants. Uh, so if somebody wants to say blah, 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 <laughs> he has the independence to do that. <laughs> so, and the point is, different people, they see, th they get different ideas and they present it. And as you say that they confuse. They confuse because they are confused. <laughs> What will happen when you follow uh, a confused individual? Do you think following a confused individual you get sanity? <laughs> following a confused individual you just get confusion. Uh, so that is the problem. And as you said, yes, life would have been much better without them. <laughs> and that's why our point is, don't worry about them. Just carry on with your Krishna consciousness. Right? <laughs> and if you come across somebody who is, you know, speaking all kinds of nonsense, instead of getting into arguments, you know, you say, okay, take care, take care. <laughs> and if they're willing to listen, then you can give them the right knowledge. Huh? Okay. So this is from Suraj from Leicester, England. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. My question is, what was the purpose of Lord Brahma's incarnation? Yes, what was the purpose of Brahma's incarnation? Was the, I'm sorry, sorry, no, not Brahma. What was the purpose of Buddha's incarnation? Very good, Suraj. It's a very nice question. Uh, you see, the purpose of Buddha's incarnation has been described in the Dasavata Stotram by a great devotee poet, Jayadev. He wrote a beautiful book, beautiful compo compo book of glorification of Krishna, called Gita Govindam. And these ten slokas describing ten different incarnations are the invocation of that. So, different incarnations of the Lord has been described, the purpose of their incarnation. And Buddha's incarnation has been described as Nindasi Jagga Bidehraha Shruti Jatang Sadaya Hridaya Darshita Pashughatam Keshava Dhrita Buddha Sharira Jai Jagadisha Hari Nindasi Yagga Videraha Shruti Jatam The <clears throat> concept of sacrifice that developed from the Shruti or Vedas he nindasi, he said that that's not necessary. There's no need to perform sacrifice. Why? Because in the name of sacrifice, innocent animals were being slaughtered. And seeing that unnecessary slaughter of animal in the name of the Vedas, the heart of the Lord became afflicted. Sadaya, Hridaya, 
darshita pashu ghatam sadaya means very compassionate hridaya heart very compassionate heart of the lord became afflicted seeing darshita pashu ghatam seeing the slaughtering of animals in the name of the vedas so keshava dhirita buddha sharira keshav krishna assumed the form of buddha and as buddha what did he do what did he do he said there is no need for following the vedas because in the name of the vedas the animal sacrifice was going on what is the best way to stop animal sacrifice reject the vedas so the activities of the vedas also will be rejected and so in this way in order to stop animal sacrifice Buddha, Lord appeared as Buddha, and he rejected the Vedas, which was re-established by Shankaracharya. So next one is Karunika Devi Dasi, Pranam Guru Maharaj. You said that Kardama Muni was in Shantaras. Please explain more about this quality of Kardama Muni. Mm. You see, there are five rasas. so one rasa is called shanta shanta ras is translated into english as neutrality the mellow of neutrality neutral means neither this nor that neutral means uh, if you consider the the gra- axis the graph there is axis the la- left hand side of the axis is minus right hand side of the axis is plus uh, the more we move towards the right direction plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 left direction minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 and so forth and there is the axis uh, that is zero right is neither minus nor plus so that is the meaning of neutrality neither any enemical to the lord nor uh, loving in that sense favorable favorable uh, but not active and their business or their attitude is to meditate upon the lord right there is awareness of the lord acceptance of the lord meditation upon the lord but no service no activity right on the other hand there are negative activities the demons are involved in negative activities the devotees are active in positive activities but those who are in shantarash they neither negatively active nor positively active <laughs> okay okay thank you all very much all glories to shila prabhupad gaur premanande hari hari <coughs> So how do you all like these stories? Huh? So the <laughs> So the purpose actually was to give the understanding of Krishna consciousness through the stories. So through the stories things become more easily conceivable, uh, more easily comprehensible, understandable. 